Good to see you out here this morning. Thanks for joining us in this Sunday morning worship service. And uh, this morning, before we go further, let's just look at our bulletins. If you. Um, I'd like to share a few verses with you guys this morning that I found that spoke to me. And it's very common verses. As I looked across some of the passages, some of the things that Bill put in the bulletin this morning for this uh, sermon, I came across Romans 12, uh, verses 1 and 2. Oh, boy. Now my phone decided it was... Not cool. I didn't bring my other Bible up here, so it'll take me a while. Anyways, Romans 1, 12, verses 1 and 2. You guys probably know this one, but um, living our lives out as living sacrifices. And, um, and that's our act of worship. And to this morning, we come together and we're worshiping here together, uh, also as an act of worship. But... In Romans 12, it emphasizes that when we're out there living our regular lives, that living for God in such a way is the real act of worship that God's looking for. And as I looked through my last week, and I'm a guy that likes to 
catch up on world events and different things like that. And so sometimes I find myself looking on my phone and, oh, something interesting happened. Instead of maybe reading God's word for the morning, it distracts me. And so there's so many of those things that do distract us from seeking God's will, finding out what he's saying about the day or about our lives. And in searching for God, we will also find his will for our lives. And it may be different for many of you. It may be some other distractions. But uh, let's not forget to search God on a regular basis. Let's open in prayer this morning. Dear Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your, the grace and mercy you've given to us this morning. Thank you for the breath of life you've given us. And, you know, this, this week many people have been sick or are sick. And, Lord, we want to pray for them. Um, I pray you grant them healing, grant, grant them the health that they desire. And, Lord, I pray more than anything, though, that we, we search for you so that we can have the spiritual health that we need to be able to follow you and to live our lives for you. And, Lord Jesus, as we go through this worship service this morning, guide our minds and our thoughts. I pray you open our hearts to your word and your song. And, Lord, I pray your name be glorified this morning. I praise your name. Amen. Stuart. Good morning. Somebody was nice and brought me um, clothespins this morning. Thank you to whoever did that. Before we begin worship this morning, I want everybody to paint a picture in their mind, whether you want to do this with your eyes closed or your eyes open. But imagine a set of beautiful mountains in a horizon, just the grandest, most glorious mountains you can imagine. Whether you want to put a little snow tip on the tip or the biggest trees, the redwood forest, uh, the biggest mountains with big valleys in between and a river running through the center with a big waterfall. God created those big, big mountains. He created the valleys. And as we sing our first song this morning, I want us to think about the mountain tops that we have in our life, the glorious times, the happy times, and the times that we may feel a little down in the valleys. And before we begin, I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for creating mountains as grand and snow-topped with big trees and, and, and valleys and fields and flat areas. As the mountains can represent the times in our life when we feel on fire for you and, and just ready to take on the world. And sometimes we're down in the valley and, and just walking along a field and it just feels a little bit dry and, and we feel far from you. God, I pray that you be with us wherever we are this morning. Be with the people that are in the mountains. Be with the people that are in the valleys. Be with the people that are at home that are struggling right now with, with health issues that might feel a little bit down, might feel a little bit like they're in a valley. God, as we sing this morning, we thank you for being a God of mercy, a God of grace, and a God who loves us whether we are on the mountain or whether we're in the valley. We thank you for that. Amen. Mountain, the river flows, and it brings refreshing wherever it goes. Through the valleys and over the fields, the river is rushing and the river is here. The river of God sets our feet a dancing. The river of God fills our hearts with cheer. The river of God fills our mouths with laughter, and we rejoice.
This next song is a song we haven't sung for a long time. Back when I just entered youth, we sang it a lot. And as I was thinking about all the people that are not in our congregation this morning of, due to feeling ill or feeling not so good and maybe lying in bed and maybe listening to the service, I figured there couldn't be a more fitting song that would be for those people this morning. And it can be for us here too, the people that aren't feeling ill. But uh, it talks about trading your sorrows, trading your shame, trading your sickness, and just laying it down to the Lord. When you feel depressed, when you feel that fear of whether you're going to ever get through this, the best is just to lay it down at the feet of the God. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my pain, I'm laying them down for the joy of stand for our last two songs.
last song that we chose to sing this morning is a song that the generation before me or maybe my parents' generation sang a lot. And I know that a lot of them are, are not here this morning. And so I feel like there's somebody out there that really needed to hear the song. As I was picking the songs, um, I just felt a nudge from God that there's somebody that's not in our congregation right now that really needs to hear these words. Team. Um, children's Church is going to happen now, so the kids are dismissed. And ushers, could we get ready for the offering? Let's ask God's blessing on the offering before we take it. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the gift of life you've given us. I thank you for the gift of salvation. I thank you, Lord, for your greatness. And Lord, I thank you for the provisions you've given us. And Lord, you have blessed us richly. And as we give back to you, Lord, I pray your name be glorified. Praise your name.
Thank you for your gifts. Next, I call on Pastor Bill for the message this morning. Good morning. That better? It's good if I turn things on. J- Jason had his problems with his electronics, and I was thinking as he, as he said that, oh boy, I usually come up here with backup paperwork. I told Sachet that this just this week, and uh, this morning as I got to my office, I hit print, and the printer was off, and I'm just like, yeah, I'll trust my electronics this time. So I'm really hoping they, they well, I trust God that they, will, that they will continue to function good. But uh, it is interesting how we, how we focus or how we have our conveniences and we get used to a certain way of things. But right now, I want to give you guys a little chance to look out the window. If you look out the window, you see the light clouds, and if you feel the gentle breeze, that's nothing compared to, or that's very nice compared to what New Orleans is facing this morning. There's a Category 4 hurricane with winds of 145 miles an hour headed for the new Louisiana coast. Should hit there sometime lunch shortly after. It is a storm that, is, has, that was looking like it might even come our way this, uh, in the beginning of the week, but now has turned and completely missed us and is now uh, has intensified from a little wave to a massive storm. And it is something that we should take very uh, seriously as Christians. If we look around the world, we see all kinds of things that are going wrong or things that are happening. We look at Afghanistan, and due to the American decision to withdraw, there is so much chaos there. There is so much killing there. There is so much um, destruction and loss of life. It's scary to think. And we don't even have to look that far, but we see right here in our community. Last Sunday, our church was almost empty. It's so good to see you guys back here. I see several faces that, that didn't make it last time. But it's good to have you all back here, and it's good for us to be able to get together like this in this comfort. So let's take a moment and pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the clouds that are outside. We look off in the distance below the hills, and we see that uh, there is rain out there. But Lord, we are in such comfort here. So Father, this morning we want to remember those people in the southern Louisiana states or the, the, the area that is going to get impacted by this hurricane. Father, we pray that your hand would be there. We pray that your hand would lead those people to safety, that you would, that you would let the, the, the storm not have its way with the people there, that it would not be the destruction and the chaos that we usually see. Father, I pray that you would give comfort to those people, that you would show your love to them there. Lord, you have been there the whole week preparing, and we have seen it on the news coming all the time. And so, Father, we know that the people are aware of what's going on, but it is still something very, very dangerous. And so, Father, I pray for those people this morning. May your peace and your comfort be with them. Lord, I also pray for those in Afghanistan who are so desperately trying to get out. I pray for those people who want to get back to safety. I pray for those who are leading that, that you would give them direction, that you would give them a way forward, that you would give them a way to to bring peace to the nation over there. Lord, be with them. Let the people that believe in you there, let your light shine to them. Help them to make the most of every opportunity. And Father, I thank you for the health that we see, for the people that are coming back into church and the way that, that we see that our community is, is looking, um, looking good again. We pray that you would continue to heal, that you would continue to guide the people back into a healthy relationship and into a healthy life and in being able to provide for families. Father, thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for what you will do. And we pray that your peace would be with those people as well. Lord, now as, I turn, as we turn to your word, I pray that the meditation of my heart and the meditation and <laughs> the words are gone. Father, I pray that you would be honored and glorified through what I have to say this morning. May that be to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Last Sunday, lay pastor Peter talked about unity not uniformity. He talked about how 
even in our differences, we can glorify God because that is what our calling is. He read a portion of Revelation chapter 7 where, where it talks about the nations, all the nations, that tri- people from every tribe and from every nation standing in front of God and praising and worshiping Him. And he asked the question, how do we get there from here? As I was listening to him speak, I was thinking, man, this is just so perfect with, with what I had planned to speak on. And so I was frantically taking notes, and I guess my notes weren't very good, but uh, the beauty is we can get back to listening to it online later again. So um, it, is, it is one of those privileges that we also get from electronics. But he talked about how we are here to glorify God. Today, I want to look a little bit different, at it a little bit of a different angle. I want to look at making the most of every opportunity. There is a lot of passages in the Bible that talk about making the most of every opportunity because the time is short. So if you would turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4, we're going to start reading from verse 2. I'm going to read from verse 2 to verse 6. It says this, Devote yourselves to, be, to prayer, being watchful and thankful, And pray for us, too, that God may open the door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for I, or as I, for I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in every way, in the way that you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I want to look specifically today at a very little piece, there's much more to this obviously, but a very little piece of verse 5 where it says, make the most of every opportunity. I remember when I was like 11, 10, 11, 12 years old, I, uh, me and my cousin were very close at that time and we, we really wanted to be grown-ups. I couldn't wait to make it to 14. I really wanted to be 14 years old. Because guess what? They didn't have junior youth back then. They didn't have the ability for us or the availability for us to go and do all those fun things that the youth were doing at that time. So I couldn't wait to be 14. And my cousin and I came up with a scheme. It was more my cousin than me, so I'm I'm the sane one here. Uh, We came up with this scheme that we needed to be adults. We wanted to be adults so bad that we we wanted to have a beard. We're 11 years old, 12 years old, something like that, so the beard doesn't grow at that age. And so he came up with this idea that if we shave every day, maybe the beard will start to grow. So that's what we did for a little while. Kind of silly. I'm sure none of you have ever done something like that. But that's how badly we wanted to grow up. We wanted to get older where we could do the things that adults were doing because that was where the life was. Yesterday, my nephew got married from my youngest sister who's two... two, uh, kids down from me, and uh, I looked in the mirror and I went, where in the world did the time go? Time is short. The more I see my gray hair, the more I realize how short our time on earth is. And so it makes it all the more imperative that we understand that we make the most of every opportunity. Did you know That in a baseball game, I love baseball, so I use those analogies some. Did you know that in a baseball game, the home team is always responsible to bring 24 balls to the game? The ball that they are playing with usually does not get more than six minutes of playtime, ever. And then it gets thrown out. Did you know that if you would take a pencil, you would roll out from here to Orange Walk, you would roll out a piece of paper, and you would start drawing one line all the way down that, that, that paper, it would not make it to Orange Walk before that pencil is done. Did you also know that a pen wouldn't make it to Cruceros, to the restaurant? There's only a short time of usefulness in these items. Did you know that if you live 70 years, you would spend 23, hours, or 23 years of that 70 years sleeping? 16 years you would spend working, eight eight years you would watch TV. This is the average uh, of the study that they did. Might not be true for everywhere, but it is true in, in an average form. You would spend six years eating, four years being sick. Two years, and this is for only women, men don't take this long, but two years getting dressed. Yeah. 
Me, I go find a pair of pants. If they don't smell too bad, I'm good to go. <laughs> but women like to take their time. So on average, they're saying about two years just putting on your clothes. Do you also realize that you only practice your Christianity in that 70 years about half a year? That's the average in the world. For some of us, that's much higher. And I thank God for each and every one of you that does that. But the time is very short, and how we use that time is of utmost importance. I don't know who came up with those numbers, so don't judge me if they're off. It's just a rough calculation, but it is a good example for us to use. You may be asking what that time is for. I've told you several times already. Time is short. It is important how we use those times. What I'm trying to say is that we can only have one chance. We only have one chance to do this life. We only have one chance to make the decisions and to get them right. We don't have a do-over button. We can't, a long time ago, Staples in, in Ontario would have, a, have this commercial, press the easy button. We don't have a do-over button. The choices that we make in this life are the choices that will stick with us forever. They don't change. You cannot go back and change them. Did you know that if you go on the internet and you put something out there that you really didn't want and you hit delete, somebody can still find it. It does not matter how many years go by. The right person, knowing how to find it, can find even those things that you have deleted. The same thing happens in our lives. When we have made a decision and we have said something or done something, no matter how much we apologize for it, no matter how much we try to take it back, we still put it out there, and it is still out there. For an unbeliever, they have nothing to hope for in eternity. They have nothing to look forward to beyond this life. And so it's no wonder that they make the decisions that they make. It's all about me. It's all about what I can get in this world. It's all about what I can get with the time that I have. The more money I have, the happier I'm going to be. The more successful I am, the more people will revere me. And so it's easy for us to see how they make the decisions that they make. But as Christians, we have that hope of eternity. We have that Revelations chapter 7 moment in, in our future where we stand and we go, God, you are awesome. You are wonderful. You are the magnificent one. We are here to glorify you. So as Christians, we have that opportunity. We have that hope. We have that foresight in our future where we will be able to do all of those things. But it's still easy for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's still easy for us to say, we've prayed the prayer. We have prayed that prayer of forgiveness. We have asked Jesus into our hearts. We have forgiveness of sins, and so we're good. That's it. We don't need to do anymore. We put that pillow of comfort under our head, and we coast to the end. If I end up in heaven, that's all that matters, right? That's all that we're here for. There's a season in life. There's only a short time. Have you ever gone through a tunnel? I have had the privilege of being a truck driver for many years in North America. And when you run the Pennsylvania Turnpike or you run through, even from Windsor to Detroit, there are tunnels. They, they have tunneled uh, a road underneath the, the river for the border between. But as you go into the tunnel, it gets dark. And then you start to see those little lights that pop up. They have put on their way so that you can see a little bit of what's going on where you are. But then as you get closer to the end, you're going towards that light, and you start to see that little light way off in the distance. It starts shining brighter and brighter. And the closer you get, the brighter that light gets until finally poof, you get out and you see the outside. You see the sun shining again. You see the light that you have been aiming towards. And it's going to be magnificent like that for us when we get into heaven. Last Sunday, Peter said, what we have now may not compare to what we will have in heaven. But while we are still here, we have opportunities. While we are here, a friend of mine posted this, and it's so fitting. He said this, don't be so focused on the light at the end of the tunnel that you miss the lights 
in parentheses, the opportunities along the way. We all have opportunities in this life to do good. We all have opportunities to serve. We all have opportunities to glorify God by what we do and how we do it and what we say. There are two types of opportunities, though. There are the ones that we grab onto, we take a hold of, and we make the most of, and there are the ones that we missed. Two weeks ago, I had a call from a friend of mine who called me and asked me for prayer. He called me early in the morning, and I was a little bit busy with other things, but I was so glad that he called me, and he asked me to pray for someone that was sick. And so we talked a little bit more, and we talked about that, and then we said goodbye, and I hung up. It didn't hit me till about two days after, and this is where I'm kind of slow sometimes, but it didn't hit me until about two days after that I was talking to him. I was on the phone. I was already talking to him. Why didn't I just say, okay, why don't we just pray over the phone? Or why didn't I go over to their house? But it never occurred to me. Like I say, I'm a little bit slow that way. So even while I did pray for him, I missed the opportunity to pray with him. And so those are opportunities that we miss sometimes. Sometimes we have the opportunities to just do something, and we completely miss the boat. Colossians 4 verse 5, the last part says, make the most of every opportunity. So as Christians, we need to look at what kind of opportunities do we have. There are a lot of opportunities everywhere. We don't have to look very far. Just last year when all those floods were there, I saw so many of you donate towards the flood victims. And some of us had the privilege and the honor to go and to distribute those goods. There are a lot of good things that we can do. Maybe it's an encouragement. Maybe it's praying for somebody. Maybe it's just visiting an elderly person that is lonely. Maybe it's an opportunity for us to tell someone about Jesus. This is an opportunity that I think we often, myself included, fail in. We have a person in front of us, and we're talking to them, and we sense this urging by the Holy Spirit to just tell them about Jesus, and yet we walk away from there and not do it. Opportunities missed. Maybe it's just being a servant, sweeping the floors. Maybe it's something simple that somebody else will benefit from. Maybe you're on the receiving end of those opportunities. Over the past years, I have been so incredibly humbled and blessed by a lot of your generosity that sometimes I don't know, quite know how to say thank you. Most of the time, I don't. You have been a blessing to me so many times. And just like that, there are seasons when we can receive the blessing that somebody else is giving. So for those of you who are serving, and I'm sure most of you are, if not all of you, who are doing those things, I just want to say thank you. And I want to say this is not about me saying you're not doing the job. I'm just encouraging you to keep going and to look for opportunities. It is so important that we seize those opportunities because that is what brings purpose to our lives. That is what brings the meaning to our lives. One of the things, and I've probably shared that here already, is one of the things I used to do at a, at a Tim Hortons, at a drive through for those of you who have been there, it is, it is the most fun thing in the world for me to do, is when I get to, the, to where you order the food, and then you go forward, and the car behind you pulls up, then uh, when you get to the teller or where you're going to pay and receive your food, you just pay for the person behind you, even though you don't have a clue of who they are. It's really fun. It actually does something inside of our hearts. It fills you with a kind of a purpose. It fills you with a joy because that is what God created us for. God created us for doing good, for helping others, for serving, and that is what brings meaning and purpose to our lives. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 says this, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you to a prophet to the nations. Now, I'm not saying that you guys are all prophets. As a matter of fact, I don't consider myself one. But this was the word that Jeremiah had. Jeremiah was, was built, was made, was formed in the womb by God to be a prophet to the nations, to tell the nations about him. And so, even though we may not be prophets, those words are just as true for us. Before you were even a thought in your mom's mind. 
God already had a complete plan for your life. Revelation 7 describes the finish, but the plan is here, and the dangers that we have of missing out if we're not aware of them is huge. This purpose that we have, that God has built into us, gives meaning to our life. It adds value, it adds peace, and it adds joy. Thomas Carlyle wrote, A man without a purpose is like a ship without a rudder. He is a waif or a no man. When we fulfill that purpose that God has built us for, it gives meaning to our lives. So the question I, that Peter asked last week, I'll ask again, what on earth am I here for? Rick Warren says it this way, in a purpose-driven life, he begins off by saying, it's not about you. The purpose of life is far greater than our own personal fulfillment, than your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you have to begin with God. I've often heard people say things like, when I make more money, then I'm going to start giving to the church. When I have my payments under control, then I'm really going to be able to start giving to the church. Friends, let me tell you this. I used to have that mindset. I had a trucking company that was failing. 9-11 was going hard. My payments were short. I could almost never see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was looking at those little lights for a glimmer of hope. And so every Sunday when it came time to go to church, my thoughts were, I can't. I cannot give that little bit because I don't have it. There's not enough to make the payments. And it wasn't until I realized that when I make that the first thing in my, my paycheck every month, if the tithe becomes the first thing in my payments, I, or, or yeah, in my plans for, for where my money is going to go, I have found that even though there may not be enough at the end of the month, those dollars that are left actually go farther than if I had not given that part first. I'm not saying you're going to have a million dollars in the bank. That's, I'm not a pro prophet, I mean, faith for prosperity type of a preacher. What I'm saying is, God has a way of stretching your dollars even farther if you put him first. This is one of the things, putting an opportunity out there, it does not give you an excuse. Maybe people say, once I fix my own problems, then I can help others. I know all about the log and the speck and uh, all of that stuff. That's not what Jesus is saying there. Jesus is not saying, make sure your life is perfect before you help somebody else. What I want to get to is, if we want to focus on our problems before we help someone else with their problems, if we want to focus on ourselves, Satan will always, always, always make sure you have another problem to focus on. I've heard it said we need to work on the spiritual health of our church. That bothers me. Be, uh, sorry, let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. We need to work on the spiritual health of our church before we send people out into, into the mission field, before we send people out to help other people. That bothers me. Because as long as we focus on ourselves, Satan will always add another problem to focus on. When we start focusing on what God has created us for, when we start focusing on what God has made in this world and what the opportunities that we are given, the problems that we have in our own lives will diminish because we stop focusing on our own problems and we start focusing on what God's mission for our lives is. And that is where the meaning of life is. That is where we find hope. That is where we find joy. And that is where we find peace. If you're waiting for the right time to grab hold of those opportunities, the right time will never be right. It reminds me of the story of Chinese culture. I don't know how true this is, but the Chinese have a table with a, round, with a little turntable. I was reminded of the one in San Carlos. It has a turntable on it, and they have platters of different kinds of food placed on it. And as it comes by you, you grab whatever you want off that plate. The problem with, their, with, their, with that is that as soon as it's passed, it doesn't tend to come back. This is a Chinese culture. They take it off. So if you don't grab a hold of what's here now, you're going to miss the food that's on that plate. God has made us all to fulfill certain things. 
there's a joke of a little boy who's standing there and he's all hands in his pocket and all downcast and he says this. He says, God has given me a certain amount of things to fulfill in life. Right now I'm so far behind, I'll never die. That's not quite right. The simple fact is, if we miss that opportunity, it is most likely gone. Yes, a similar one may come around and maybe that same one, but there's a good chance it will never come back again. When Paul was in prison, this is where he wrote Colossians, by the way. Paul wrote this. He says, I'm in prison. If Paul had wanted to, he could have focused on his own problems. He could have focused on me. Here's my situation. I'm in chains. I can't do anything. And he could have become overwhelmed with his problem and focused only on himself. If anybody had the right to do that, Paul in prison would have had the right. He could have said, I guess I'm just stuck. I can't do anything. I guess I'm just going to sit here and wait until the opportunity changes. Maybe sometime down the road I'll be able to help. But instead of focusing on his own problems, he said, this is the situation I'm in. What do I do with it? So he started writing letters. He encouraged people. He sent out people of his own. He talked to people that came and visit. He did everything. And because of the letters that he wrote, I'm standing in front of you here now talking about Colossians. Because of the letters that he wrote, I'm encouraging you guys to do your part in the Christian kingdom. Because Paul didn't focus on his own problems, we see and we know how to serve God and how to praise him and worship him and glorify him better. The other thing that Paul asks is that we pray for, that, that, the, that the people pray for him. Do you guys know that when you pray for your pastor, that you guys take a part in the message that gets brought here in the countless hours that he spends in the office or visiting somebody? You guys get a part in that ministry by a simple thing like remembering them in your prayers. That is an act that we all can do. Not only can we all do that, like Paul, that is something that should be of utmost importance in our lives. We all have a purpose. We all have opportunities in our lives to tell others about God. I was talking to Abe Rempel this morning, and he says, so often I get that nudging, and he says, I, I walk away because I didn't have the guts to tell somebody about Christ. We have those opportunities, and yet if we don't seize them when they are there, we miss them. Proverbs 10 verse 5 says this, He who gathers the crops in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during the harvest is a disgraceful son. Basically what he's saying is, make hay while the sun shines. Right now is not a good time for baling hay. Make hay while the sun shines. Do the part that you can while you are here in this time that God has given you. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, Paul writes this, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. When we look at the news, like I spoke about this morning already, it's easy to become overwhelmed. We can start focusing on all the problems. We can start focusing on all the negativities. With COVID, we've had oodles of opportunity to see all the negatives, but we fail to see how we as Christians can take a part in the opportunities that arise from that. When we focus on the problem, we're not focusing on God's mission for our lives. Genesis chapter 24, we have a beautiful example. It was a young lady who was pretty normal. She had an everyday life. She had chores to do. She had everything that any normal girl would have to do in her day and age. One of the things that was there was that she had a chore to bring water from the well to the house. So one day, nothing unusual about the day, she comes forward and she's headed down to the well and she's going to bring water for her family. And as she gets there, there's this stranger standing there with some animals around him. And I'm sure she didn't pay a whole lot of attention or maybe she paid extra attention because when strangers are there, you never know who it might be. But as she gets closer, this man asks her for a drink. Now, Rebecca could have said very simply, you're a man, you're a lot stronger than I am. Take the bucket and do it yourself. Or she could have said, that's your problem, I don't care. But instead, she not only gives him water, she then offers to give her, his, the man's camels water. Do you know how much one camel drinks? 
A camel can go 17 days without water, or is it 27? I'm not quite sure, but it's a long time anyway. They can go for a long time without water, but when they drink, hi yi yi 28 gallons is what one camel will drink in one time. This man had 10 camels. Here's Rebecca with her bucket in the well, 280 gallons of water. Wasn't an easy job. It wasn't a job she had even been asked for, but she saw the opportunity to help someone in need, and she took it. Because of that, her whole life changed. Because of that, and ladies, girls, those of you who are looking for that marriage partner, this may not happen if you give somebody a glass of water. I just got to warn you up front, but it could. Because of that, this man takes and puts a nose ring in her nose, gives her a bunch of jewelry and gold and all kinds of precious stuff, and goes home with her. Now imagine if you were to walk into your house and say, Mom, I gave this guy a glass of water, and guess what I got? Look at my nose ring. I'm not sure your parents would appreciate that very much. <laughs> but the simple fact is, not only did she get rewarded for a completely un unasked for act of kindness, she got rewarded with about 6,000 rupees is what they figured it is. A an immense amount of money for her in those days for a teenage girl. But on top of that, this stranger then says, you are an answer to God's prayer. You are the answer that I was looking for. And because of that, your life is going to change forever. You will never, ever, ever be the same again. And you will be a part of history. You will be one of the ancestors of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He didn't say it in all those words, but that's what we're seeing now as we go from there. There's an opportunity in front of every one of us. It may not be a thankful place. It may not be something where we can, will get instant gratification. We may not get that gold. We may not get that marriage partner, what, what have you. But if we are faithful in doing those things that God has called us for, if we are faithful to the plan that our planner has set before us, the reward will be eternal. Matthew 6 verse 4 says, even if you don't get thanks for on this earth, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. God has bigger plans for each and every one of us than we could ever dream of. Rick Warren says, and I agree with this, he uh, asked the question, and uh, I'll ask it to you. Do you know what the most dangerous two words are to ever use in a prayer? Anybody know? Two words, very small words. I'll tell you, the most dangerous prayer you can ever pray using those two words is, use me. That's it. Use me. When we start praying that prayer and we start earnestly me me uh, meaning that and we start living a life of God, use me, I want to warn you right now, fasten your seatbelts, hang on to the steering wheel, you're in for a roller coaster ride because you never know what God has planned for you. You don't know where he's going to take you. You don't know the things that you're going to experience in this life, and some of them will not be comfortable. But I guarantee you this, they will be rewarding. I pray that each and every one of us uses those two words in every prayer that we pray. God, use me. However you see fit, use me. I promise you it'll all be worth it in the end. When you stand before God, when you get to the end of that tunnel, when you stand in that bright light and you are absolutely awestruck at the magnificence that is standing before you, and you hear these words from Matthew 25 where he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. It will be worth it in the end. I guarantee it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for that little rain that we had, and thank you for your word. Thank you for the rain that we have in our mind when we read the Bible, for the rain that you give on us, the blessings that you bestow on us. And Father, I pray now that as we face this world this week, whatever comes, that we will have the prayers of God use us in our mind, and that we will be open and looking for opportunities of where we can bless the people that we come in contact with, whatever that is, however small or however 
however big and however much change or no, no change at all we see in our personal lives. But Father, help us to be faithful to that. Help us to be the hands and the feet that you have called for us. Father, I am so convinced that you have a plan for us and that you have the best in mind for us, even though we may not see it at the moment. But Father, use us. Use us as vessels to bring glory to your name, to bring honor, to bring praise. And Father, out of that is where we will get our peace and our joy and our contentment. Lord, I pray for each and every person here. I pray that you would go with us that you would lead us and that you would make us useful in your kingdom in whatever way you have designed us for. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you all for coming. It has been an honor to speak to you today. You are dismissed.